before I introduce myself, I wanted to say that when I was watching the soldiers in training for service, I made sure this morning that my necktie came over my belt buckle. <laughs> because I understand that's very important in great Bible. Bible school. Not on? Now it's on? Can you hear me? I can't hear. I hear you now. Okay. Well, my name is Rodney Bowyer. I am the pastor of Grace Bible Community Church in Newington, Connecticut. And um, the Saints of Grace Bible Church say good morning to all you folks. My wife is online. Good morning. She sends her warm welcomes to everybody also. I had a pleasant surprise this morning. Uh, one of the people who watches me on the Internet saw that I was struggling reading my Bible. I've reached that age where normal print Bibles are obsolete in my world. So he bought me a nice new large print King James Bible, and he brought it here today for me. So thank you very much. I call him Andy from Chicago, because that, that's his name for me. So open your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 1. And I've been, uh, the, word, the word of life that I am to hold forth for you this morning is on the subject of election, free will, and grace truth, subjects that are dear to my heart. So welcome to the Chicago Grace Conference today. The doctrine of election is a doctrine that has created more confusion for Christians throughout the ages than possibly any doctrine there is. So this morning in Ephesians chapter 1, we'll begin reading at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful this morning for the great salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful that many, many years ago, Jesus Christ spread his arms, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross where he bled, died, was buried, was raised again from the dead according to the scriptures. And today, by simple faith in that finished work, we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of thy grace. I thank you this morning for the unspeakable gift that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in verse 3, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in heavenly places in Christ, but notice that it's according as or in accordance with. For example, look down in verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In other words, if it wasn't for the riches of his grace, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Notice chapter 3, verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So if it wasn't for the gift of the grace of God, Paul never would have been made a minister. So in our verses today, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him. In other words, if we're not in him, there are no heavenly blessings in Christ. So it behooves us this morning to understand what it means to be chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I can tell you this from experience, and you already know this, that Christendom at large is confused about these passages of Scripture. Notice verse 5 continues with, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, this will put a stick in your spokes very quickly. Because, you know, to some people, these verses mean that God elected some people to go to heaven and he elected some people to go somewhere else. I said that very nicely, okay? But many denominational believers today are confused about these doctrines. You know, they, they don't understand how you get into Christ. And so they're also confused about the doctrines of salvation. You know, they're saved one day, they're lost the next. That's confusion. As a matter of fact, never has the religious world been more confused about these doctrines than the day and age in which we live in today. The doctrines that have come out of verses 4 and 5 have put many people under the fear and bondage. For example, a man who believed that God elected some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell had a daughter who came home from Sunday school one morning and she said, Daddy, I got saved this morning. And he said, yeah, we'll see. And then he spent the rest of his life looking for evidence in her life and he looked for his daughter to be perfect and when she failed, he put her under the condemnation of the law and he'd say, see, I knew you weren't saved. Now, can you imagine growing up in a legalistic, graceless home like that? I mean, what, what, what do you think could possibly happen to a young person who is consistently placed under a performance-based system that she can never live up, never live up to? I mean, do you think that when she grows up and she leaves the, 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 the legalism and the whiplash of that tyrant and leaves the condemnation of that home, that she'll want anything to do with this Christian, legalistic, law-keeping, performance-based religion? You think she'd want anything to do with that? No. Well, not understanding who you are in Christ, and more importantly... How you get in Christ leads to much confusion. And it comes from not understanding. A lot of it comes from not understanding what this predestination means. Nowhere in the word of God does predestination ever have to do with salvation. No one is predestinated to be saved. And no one is predestinated to not be saved. Predestination, the word itself tells you exactly what it means. It's a destination that has been prearranged by God for you. For example, if you and your family plan a trip to Disney, say you plan it a year before you go, your destination has been pre-planned. It's pre-arranged. So the day comes for you to take off and go on your trip to Disney and you get in your car and your destination is prearranged. Is the family next door to you part of that destination? No. If they want to be part of that destination that you prearranged, they need to get in your car and then their destination will be the predestination that you prearranged because it was already arranged by you. But only those in the car get to experience the destination. Well, it's the same thing with biblical predestination. No one experiences the destination that God prearranged before the foundation of the world until they are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're not experiencing that destination. You're experiencing another destination. So it's important for us to know how a person gets in Christ. Because that's the first step into understanding what predestination does not mean and what it does mean. So before you were saved, God looked at you, or I should say before you're in Christ, 
God looked at you through the law. He looked at you through the Ten Commandments at least. I mean, you remember Galatians 4.21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Do you not hear Mount Sinai, the thunder, the lightning, the earthquake? Do you not hear the threatening voice of Mount Sinai saying to you, the soul that sinneth, it shall die? God shall by no means clear the guilty. If you don't continue in all things that are written in the book of the law, you're cursed. Tell me ye that desire to be under the law. Every fallen child of Adam is under the law and they will be judged by the law. The sentence of death is upon you. If you're not in Christ, then one day you heard the gospel. You heard that Jesus Christ died for you, that he shed his blood, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And then you heard when you believed, you heard that it was by grace through faith in the finished work of that cross. And you embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ and you believed and you trusted that what Jesus Christ did on that cross was adequate and sufficient to forgive you of every sin you had ever committed. And when you believe God stopped looking at you through the law and he began looking at you in through Christ and in Christ. And then all of a sudden, rather than your destination being eternal death. And having eternal hell to face. You received eternal life. And your destination was heaven. Will be heaven for all of eternity. There are people who teach that. Those who are chosen. Were chosen by God before they ever believed. That's called election. Some people say that you're elected to salvation. And when you hear this call, there's no way that you can say no. There's no way that you can resist. You are elected and therefore you will respond. That's what they say. Now, if you've been saved for any amount of time, you've heard about Calvinism and Arminianism. Those are two separate schools of theology who both use the word of God to substantiate the points of view that they present. And neither of them agree with each other. Calvinism is recognized by the acrostic tulip. Tulip represents the five points of Calvinism. The T stands for total depravity, which means that you're totally incapable of responding to the gospel unless God activates that power in you there's a couple of places they get that in the word of God. One of them is found in John 6, Jesus Christ said, no man can come unto me except the father which hath sent me draw him. Draw him. You know, like if you've ever been fishing and you hook a fish on the line, you reel him in, you draw him against his will. When Jesus Christ spoke these words, the body of Christ did not exist. And therefore, those words are not spoken to you. Another verse they use, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So the Calvinists, what this means is that you are not capable of making a decision to believe the gospel. Under the teachings of Calvinism, the only decision that you can make are whether you will wear white socks or black socks, or whether you will have coffee or tea, or whether you will have vanilla or chocolate ice cream. But you cannot make a decision to believe the gospel. To them, according to Ephesians 2, 1, since you are spiritually dead, you cannot respond to a call 
that requires faith. You're not able to do that. In other words, to a Calvinist, before you are ever saved, God has to regenerate you. R.C. Sproul says, is it okay to mention names from here? I do it all the time in my pulpit, but I don't know if it's acceptable here, but... Oh, I can? All right, thank you, Brother Scarf. I mean, he makes his statements public, so I suppose I can repeat them publicly, right? (laughs) This is what he says. Regeneration precedes faith. God has to regenerate you to give you eternal life. So to them, before you can say... I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. God has to save you in order for you to say that according to that verse. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And you who hath he quickened you, he made you alive because you were dead and you couldn't do anything. But I will tell you today, that's a lie. There's nothing like the King James Bible to expose lies in Christendom. You know, in my church, in my pulpit, I frequently used a law of biblical interpretation called the law of remote context. The law of remote context simply says that when you arrive at a verse like this that could present a difficulty in your life, the answer to that verse is either in the chapter that it's found or it's in, the, it's in the book that it's found. All right, it's going to be somewhere there. Your King James Bible will always be true to you and will give you the definition, will give you the answer to a dilemma that you may be confronted with. You have to look for it. That's why the Bible said, study. Study. You don't get this stuff by osmosis. You don't wake up one morning and you have the full revelation of of, of God. No. God's not giving you revelation today. It's hard work. Studying is hard work. Well, fortunately for us, we do have the answer to this dilemma. It's found in chapter 1 and verse 13. The apostle said, In whom ye also trusted after... After that you heard. So you heard something. You trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after, after you heard, you believed. And after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You didn't get saved and then believe. You did not get saved and then you heard. You did not get saved and then you responded. You you heard, you believed, you were sealed. Nothing like a King James Bible to zap a hole through that false little theory of theirs. The next letter in, in, in the acrostic is You, which represents unconditional election. Which means God hand selects who is going to be saved. He elects some to go to heaven and the rest just get what they deserve. That's the teaching of Calvinism. And in unconditional election, the elect have absolutely nothing to say about it. God is going to save you in spite of yourself. Nothing you can do about it. Next letter is L. Limited atonement. In limited atonement, Christ died only for the elect. You know where they get that, right? Anybody? Matthew twenty twenty eight. Even Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. To the to a Calvinist, the many, well, that's not everyone. That's only the elect. Again, when this was written, the body of Christ did not exist. Jesus Christ was not speaking to you. In the dispensation of grace, 
Jesus Christ is a ransom for all. So under the old economy, he gave his life a ransom for many. Under the new economy, during the dispensation of grace, Jesus Christ gave his life a ransom for all. For all. The next letter is the letter I, which is irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. It's not a biblical term, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Irresistible grace is the notion that when God extends his grace to a person, they don't have the will or the ability or the inclination to reject it. They just can't do it. They have to come against their will. It's very similar to the case of unconditional election. The person has no choice over the matter. The verse they use to substantiate irresistible grace is Psalm 110, verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. To a Calvinist, the day of God's power is the day that God decides to save you. Not. That is not the day that God decides to save you. Psalm, 1, Psalm 110, verse 1 says... The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what that's about. That had nothing to do with you and the dispensation of grace. But to John Calvin, it did. The next letter is perseverance of the saints. Letter P. Perseverance of the saints means that once a person is saved, he's always saved. Well, they got one thing right. Even a broken clock is right two times a day. You know, even, I mean, in the revelation that God gave the apostle to the Gentiles, this is one of the clearest doctrines that are taught. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's clearly taught by Paul. Ephesians 4.30, that you are sealed. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. <coughs> By the way, hi folks online. I forgot to say hi. Texas, hi. <laughs> but this is Calvinism in a nutshell. <coughs> then there's Arminianism, which believes just the opposite of what you just heard. They say that man is not totally depraved. That there is still some good in him. And with a little effort, man, man can fix himself up and make himself presentable to God. Arminianism says that God chooses men to salvation on the basis of some foreseen good or some foreseen faith that that man will exercise out there in the future. Arminianism teaches that Christ died in order to save every man, but God's grace can be resisted. And then that's concerning the perseverance of the faith or of the saints. Arminianism teaches that a Christian can forfeit his salvation once he has it. So both of these theological points of view are simply man-made religious systems that are riddled with holes and have serious theological flaws in them because although they're both based, biblically based, they are, these men are guilty of not rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what these men are guilty of. It is the simple, yet for some, very difficult concept to leave with Israel what belongs with Israel and with the body of Christ what belongs with the body of Christ and then with Israel again what belongs with Israel. This is extremely difficult for these highly educated Dr. T-H-D-D-D-D-F-F-F. I have an HSD. High school diploma. <laughs> but you know.
you know, <laughs> to mix, to mix scripture like they do and try to make it apply to all people in all dispensations is, is to commit spiritual suicide. I mean, you may as well take your Bible and cut every single verse out individually, put them in a big bowl. And then when you wake up in the morning, you just reach your hand in there and you pull one out. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. Then the next morning you wake up and you reach in that bowl. You get Deuteronomy 28. Because thou did not obey the voice of the Lord thy God, thou shalt be cursed in the field. Thou shalt be cursed coming in, coming in. You go, ah, what? It's not going to be a good day. Next day, you take that thing out, you go, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. And I'm forgiven all trespasses in Christ. And you go through and you have a great day. Next day, you take that thing out. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after that, we've received the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice, but a certain fearful looking for of of judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And you, you walk through the, the day you're shaking. And they're saved one day and they're lost the next. And they don't know who they are in Christ. And they don't know how they obtained their salvation. And you ask them, how did you get saved? And they say, well, I'm doing the best I can. And, and I'm going to church and I give. And, and they'll never, not, not one of them can ever give you an answer to the simplicity of salvation by grace through faith in what Jesus Christ did on that cross for me. And I'm trusting in his blood to forgive me of all my sins. They cannot give you those simple, fundamental answers that the children in our Sunday school room right now can answer like that. You don't, this is not how you study the Bible. You rightly divide it. That's how you study it. It must be rightly divided. So let's continue. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 34, Jesus Christ is speaking to Israel. He tells them that they will inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In the dispensation of grace, the apostle said that according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So God, God has a plan for Israel from the foundation of the world. But God's plan for the body of Christ is before the foundation of the world. So in eternity past, God had a, God put together a plan. The triune God got together in the, the councils of eternity and they planned that God something would happen, something would be done for a group of people called, that would be called the body of Christ. He prearranged that his son would come into the world and do something for that group of people that they could not do for themselves. And he sent Jesus Christ and he did something. And then he did something with that group of people that he had never done with any other group of people before. And he made them a heavenly people, like Brother Fr uh, Frank. Uh, was th uh, yeah, Frank. Wherever you are. I almost said Fred, but it's Frank. And so God planned that he would take those who believed and trusted in the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ and he would put them in christ no one is in christ until they believe the gospel no one is chosen in christ until they believe and then they become part of the one who was chosen before the foundation of the world jesus christ is the elect of god we read that in Isaiah 42, uh, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. No one is in the elect until they believe the gospel of 
their salvation. Today, in the dispensation of grace, salvation is available to all men without concern of nationality, without concern of color, or language, or position, or wealth, without concern of anything. Today, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Today, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Brother Jordan, you ever see this slide before? I copied it from him. Some people call that plagiarism. I call it. Thank you, Brother Jordan. <laughs> See, this is the gift. This is the gift. This is how it works. But just imagine if you have children and suppose that Calvinism is true. That means that some of you here today who have children that are saved have children that might possibly go to hell. You might have children who are not the elect and their destiny is not your destiny. You realize that if Calvinism is true, you don't have good news for your children. Imagine looking at your child and saying, well, if you're one of the elect, you'll get saved. If you're not, too bad. If election as, ta as taught by Calvinism or Calvinists is true, you do not have good news for your family, which is a sad, sad state of affairs. But that's why election today has to be a lie. Because I have good news. I have good news to every fallen child of Adam on this side of eternity. I have good news. And, if, and I'll tell them I've got good news for you. And if they say, what is it? I'll say, you don't have to die and go to hell. Because Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid the penalty for your sins. He rose again from the dead. And if you believe that and trust in that for the forgiveness of your sins... God will save you. He will reconcile you to himself and your home for all of eternity will be heaven. The only reason people do not get saved today is because they will not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with election. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your response to the gospel of salvation. Now, Let's continue with uh, Romans 1, 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, what is predestination? Well, it means that a destination is prearranged. It's that simple. Suppose a man decides that he wants to go from Chicago to Hartford. And he has three vehicles that he can choose from. He has a Cadillac. He has a Lexus. He has a BMW. So he plans for a trip to Hartford, Connecticut. And so the morning of his journey, he, or even before the journey, he goes outside. He looks at those three cars and he says, I'm going to choose the Lexus to take my journey. And so he decides that. He will drive there in his Lexus. His destination is already predetermined. He's going to Hartford. So he takes off in his Lexus. And on his way to Hartford, halfway there, he sees you hitchhiking. Now, you've heard about Hartford before. You'd love to go visit Hartford. Matter of fact, you'd love to go and stay in Hartford forever. Hartford's a nice place. But you have, there's a problem. You're lost. You don't know how to get to Hartford. You're broke. You don't have any money to pay for that trip. And you're really out of strength. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, God sent Alexis. <laughs> you see the picture, right? 
So the Lexus stops and offers you a free ride. So you get in the Lexus because you don't have to pay anything. You don't have any money to pay. You can't afford it. You can't earn it. And because you know yourself, you know you definitely don't deserve it. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he opened up his window and he said, I'm going to Hartford and I'm willing to give you a free ride. So being the sensible person that you are, you get in the Lexus. And then you take your ride to a destination that was already predetermined before you even knew there was a predestination that had been predestined. And you take off in the Lexus and you both arrive to Hartford safely. And I'm certain that you can see the simplicity of this illustration. I tried to make this as easy and as simple for us to understand. I'm a very simple man. So I have to make things easy to understand. That's called predestination. God's plan for the body of Christ was predestined before the foundation of the world. God planned something that would happen in the future, way back here in eternity past. He planned that all those who trusted in Jesus Christ would become part of the body of Christ. And those who are in Christ are now called the chosen. But no one is chosen until they are in Christ, just like the hitchhiker. She wasn't on her way to Hartford. She didn't know how she could get there. She heard about it. She would have loved to get to Hartford, but it seemed like an impossible situation on her own until she heard that there was a free ride there. And she got in. And no one is on their way to heaven until they're in Christ. But after you are in Christ, heaven is your eternal home and your destination, which is the destination that was predetermined before the foundation of the world. That's predestination, folks. Christ is God's elect. And you are in Christ, or I should say after you are in Christ, you become part of God's elect. But he was the one who was elected before the foundation of the world. He was given a destination. When you believed, you also joined in that destination. Does that make sense? You know, the words in Christ are found 78 times in your King James Bible. Seven is the number of perfection. Eight's the number of new beginnings. You need to be in Christ. Because you're complete in Christ. And that gives you your new beginning. Allow me to close with this. When I was first saved, I was handed a book, probably six, seven months after I was saved, by a Puritan author, a Puritan author. 1600, 1700, 1800, the Puritans lived there. They were all Calvinists, every one of them. Well, I so enjoyed that book. I don't even remember what his name was. But I began traveling throughout. In, in, I was in South Florida when I was first saved to book barns. So they sell old books. And I would ask, where's the religious section? And I would go there and I would find, and you'd be amazed, the old Puritan books you could find. And those, I mean, everybody gets rid of those, you know. And I, would, and I would just get those. And then I moved from Florida to Connecticut. And in Connecticut, I got a book, Antiquarian Book Dealers. Of all the old bookstores in Connecticut, there are hundreds of I became familiar with every single one of them. And I had a vast library, an impressive library of Puritan books. I mean, impressive, like you can't believe. I had every Puritan author, and I was a Calvinist to the nth degree and I could support my Calvinist views and I could explain to you why Calvinism and why election were true based on some of the verses that I know about now 
Right division fixed me. Rightly dividing the word of truth fixed me. I shared this story a few times. I still have like 10 minutes, so I'm going to tell this story, brother. <laughs> when I learned right, when I came into right division, you know, I found out about Grace School, the Bible, and I got the course. And there's a series in the, in the, in, in the Grace School, the Bible called FOD, Fundamentals of Dispensationalism. Well, I already knew how to rightly divide because I had figured out some things. And I thought I kind of had it down pat. Well, I remember it was a VHS. I remember putting it in my little TV with the t player, right? Everybody's got one of those, right? <clears throat> I still have one. And, you know, and I, and, and I remember as I stuck it in there, I said, I don't know what this guy's going to teach me. I already know about right division. And then Brother Jordan went there and he started drawing. And I can tell you that when he got to the fall of Israel and he made his circle and he wrote the Apostle Paul and the dispensation of grace, my life changed. My life changed in that one instantaneous moment of time. And everything in my Bible just fell. Just like, you know, everything just fell in place. I mean, I had a good working knowledge of my Bible, but that fixed it. That settled it for me. And that was important. And so I, I say that to encourage you families that you don't have grade school, the Bible, you should get it because it's not just for the older people. It's for the dad and mom and the kids. It could become a weekly event for the whole family. Amen. It's a great opportunity in your life. Now, let me finish by saying this. After I was saved, <clears throat> I had not been to my hometown for over eight years. The last time they had seen me, my hair was down to here. And I had a big beard like this and, you know, typical hippie stuff, right? And uh, I went up there and I, you know, met everybody now that I'm saved. And I went back to Florida. And then when I moved to Connecticut, I got a phone call one day. Well, let me, re let me back because I had an opportunity to go visit my grandmother. My grandmother was what you would call a saintly Catholic woman. Everybody in the world knows she never sinned, right? It's one of those things. And so I went to see my grandmother, and it was just her and me, and I took my Bible out, and I started sharing with her the gospel. I started sharing with her how I got saved, and I shared with her the gospel. And as I was talking to her about all have sinned and come sure of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. My grandmother said to me, I don't know if God could ever forgive me. Now, that shocked me because I always thought, how am I going to convince her that she's got sin? I know she's never sinned. I mean, that's what you feel like about your, somebody like that. But my grandmother said, I don't know if God can forgive me. And I just remember looking at her like, wow. I said, well, God can forgive you because Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross for your sins. I said, why don't we ask Jesus Christ to save you? Back then, I was doing a sinner's prayer thing still. I wasn't rightly dividing. And so I led my mother to ask Jesus Christ to save her. My grandmother got saved. She got saved. And then I was in Hartford, and I got a phone call one day. If you want to see your grandmother alive, you need to come now. So she, my grandmother had 13 children. And so when I got to the hospital, they were all there. And all the grandchildren were there. They were out into the hallway. Okay. And the room was packed. And when I got there, somebody said, Rodney's here. And the, a way parted, just like the, Moses walking through the Red Sea. <laughs> And I, wa I walked right to her bed, and I hugged my grandmother. She saw me coming in. She started crying, and I hugged her, and she whispered in my ear. She said, I'll see you in heaven. Okay? And the next day, she went to be with the Lord. Six months ago, 
Well, after Christmas last year, I always go to Maine for Christmas to visit. I told my wife, as long as my mother's alive, I'm going, we're going to go up there. I don't believe in Christmas. I don't do Christmas, but if you do, whatever you do, or whatever. I don't, okay? But I go up there because my mother was there. I went up there with every intention this time of sitting down with my mother and sharing the gospel with her. And it didn't happen. You know, it's just so busy and there's no time. And you can't try to share the gospel with someone while there's commotion going on in the kitchen and everything else. I came back to Connecticut totally convicted and totally convinced I needed to share the gospel with my mother. And a couple weeks later, a few weeks later, I decided to make another trip up there. It's a nine-hour drive. It's not bad. I drove back up there. And my mother was living in assisted living. She had a nice little apartment. And I walked in to her apartment with my Bible, my Bible bag. And she said, oh, what do you got? I said, ah, we need to talk. Oh, have a seat. We need to talk. And for the first time in my life, I was able to sit down with my mother, just her and me, with a solemnity and a somberness that she had never experienced before. Because I put on my serious, we're going to talk, and you're going to listen, and we, you need to understand something. And I began the conversation by telling my mother, do you know why I got saved, Ma? I got saved because I was a sinner. Now, you need to understand, my mother was like my grandmother. Never been able to convince her of sin in my whole life. Matter of fact, every time I, we, we talked about sin to my mother, she started crying. And like, here she goes again. You know, what are you crying for? You know, uh, we're all sinners. No, I never did anything wrong. Oh, right? I mean, you have relatives like that. You have relatives like that. Well, this time I said, you know why I got saved? I got saved because I'm a sinner. And my mother said, well, we're all sinners. <laughs> okay. And I, and I opened up Galatians 3.10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. And I spent an hour explaining that to my mother and explaining salvation. And at the end of all that thing, I said, do you want to get saved? My mother said, oh, absolutely. I want to be saved. And my mother got saved. My, I prayed with my mother and she got saved. Last Sunday morning, I held my mother's hand as she took her last breath and went into eternity. To meet her Savior. Last Sunday morning, I even emailed Brother Jordan. I said, we're in a, we're in a, a, a town. It, there's three gigantic Catholic churches, and there's only one priest left. And they're waiting for funerals. And I won't be able to make it. Right? You got that? You say, well, why don't you come Tuesday or Wednesday? Well, come to find out, we, she got cremated on Tuesday morning. They had the funeral that afternoon, and I was able to come here Friday. The reason I'm, I'm sharing this with you is this. Every one of you have grandparents. You have parents. You have mothers. You have fathers. If they're saved, when you die, you're going to be catapulted into heaven. When you land on the runway, my grandmother and my mother are going to be standing on either side saying, come on in, Rodney, come on in. It's beautiful here. I'm anticipating that day, and I'm looking forward to that day. But I often wonder, will the landing lights be turned on when you touch down in eternity? Or will there be a sigh, a sob, and a gasp? He didn't make it. They got saved, had nothing to do with election. They got saved because they heard the gospel of their salvation and they believed it. Do you believe, have you believed the gospel of your salvation? Because you can today. I just ran out of time. Two seconds left. Hmm? What about your library? My library? Oh, I got rid of it. <laughs> I got rid of a lot of books, my library. 
I, I gave away over 500 books after I started rightly dividing. And I still have 1,000 books, but what can I say? Anyway, let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, I just pray this morning that after a message like this, that the words would be forged upon the tablets of our heart, that an understanding of salvation is not based upon whether God chose us before eternity began, but it's based upon the fact that there's a gospel that is a message that is available to all men, regardless of nationality or any other concern. I pray this morning that anyone listening to the words of this message would bow their heart, believe that Jesus Christ died for them, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and by simple faith, they would be saved. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.